when I put out an idea, sometimes you hit a home run. And then sometimes you start with a piece of clay and you, you, you work up a shape and you work up a little space and it's not right. They look at it and they say, ah, oh, this is not the right vibe. And you start again. And I agree, you know, especially when you hear the feedback and you have to really hear the feedback, look at it the way they're looking at it and see what they're bumping on. Try again. I feel like trial and error is not a fail. It's actually just a way to find the sweet spot. This is Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. On this show, I explore the intersection between passion and profit so you can achieve your own unique definition of success. I'm going to go back to my roots as a designer with today's guest, James Pierce Conley is an Emmy Award-winning television set designer. He's designed sets for shows like Bill Nye Saves the World, Martha and Snoop's Potluck Dinner Party, yes, with Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg, The Voice, and Top Chef. And I want to have James on the show to learn how it is that he does creativity on a large scale, literally with moving parts, an extremely unforgiving production schedule. And I figured that for James to do what he does, which is to express the feel of a show through architecture and through materials and fabrics and furniture and to deliver all that on time, James must really know his creative process. And you can tell from this conversation that he really does. Even if you aren't a designer, chances are you work on creative projects all the time that have lots of unknowns in the beginning. And the work that James does really just puts a magnifying glass on what it takes to make creative work come with less pain, no matter what medium it is that you're working in. So in this show, you're going to learn how do you create design that supports an idea and serves the client rather than one that just follows trends? How does James manage his creative vision across a whole staff? We'll really get inside James's head for some of his best set designs. How does he integrate a subtle design language into his concepts? And this is actually a really fun part of the conversation because you're going to get some insight into how designers can kind of telepathically talk to each other using subtle cues in their work. In this case, I think you're going to be surprised everything that you can glean from a simple spiral staircase. A little bit of listener mail before we get started. I always enjoy getting your emails and tweets and Apple podcast reviews. Here's a message from Scott who says he really enjoyed my thoughts on rereading, rewatching, and re-listening to things. He refers to the interview that Noah Kagan did of me on his podcast, Noah Kagan Presents, which is episode nine of that podcast. But Noah and I also talked about this on episode 41 of Love Your Work. In fact, Noah might have been the person who was talking about it, if I recall correctly. I'm not exactly sure. But the basic idea is there's always new information to be consumed, whether it's a podcast or a book or a show. And if you really enjoy something, just go ahead and read it or watch it or listen to it over and over again. There's no shame in that. There's always something new to be discovered. And you really start to let that information sink in. So this is something that I do. I occasionally go back and listen to my favorite episodes of this podcast right here over and over again. I always find that I've learned so much throughout the process of the podcast, throughout the lifetime of this podcast. And so when I go back to listen to the old episodes, I'm always seeing things with a completely new perspective. And there's always new lessons that are jumping out at me. So I do this with other podcasts as well. I can't tell you how many times I've watched Curb Your Enthusiasm. I can't tell you how many times I've watched each of Louis C.K.'s stand-up hours. So anyway, Scott says, quote, It's something I've been doing for the past one to two months. It's been one of the most powerful yet simple concepts I've taken away from this year. I've always fallen into the trap of finding what's next and consuming new stuff, when in reality, just as much wisdom can be gained by reabsorbing the old, unquote. Thanks for writing, Scott. I love getting your notes and feedback. Or hey, maybe you even have a question. Write a review at cadavy.net slash reviews. Tweet at me at at cadavy or email me at david at cadavy.net. And we have a new Love Your Work Elite member, Daniel Fisher. You are a saint. If you know Daniel, be sure to thank him. If you don't know Daniel, thank him anyway. In fact, let's all do it together. Ready? Thank you, Daniel. Daniel is one of the Love Your Work elite members that helps keep this show absolutely free, keeps the back catalog of now 90 episodes available for everyone, including you, to listen as they please. Remember, we have an Office Hours Hangout next Tuesday, September 19th, 8 p.m. Central. Meet face-to-face -face with everyone in the community. Ask me anything. Share your challenges as you bring more love into your work. 
sign up at lywelite.com. Check out the levels there. Pick the level with the master classes, and that will give you access to the office hours. That's lywelite.com. Now, here is James Connolly. I'm here with James Connolly, and uh, James, you designed the set for Martha and Snoop's potluck dinner party. So I guess my first question is, was designing for Martha Stewart like a little intimidating? <laughs> That's such a great question. Um, how about that? I'm 37 years old, and I got an opportunity to design Martha and Snoop's potluck dinner party for VH1. And it's um, it was... Gosh, it was uh, quite a moment to get on an email chain with Martha at first. I will tell, I will tell you that it's a privilege to work with such a mega legend. I was blown away. I, it was almost one of those um, experiences where it didn't matter how painful the process could have been. I was working for Martha Stewart. Like it was like nuts. So um, she's incredible. I will tell you that. And she is the real deal. She knows her everything. And I learned quite a bit from working with her. And I, I actually found her quite collaborative and appreciative. And um, she loved all my ideas. And she really loved working with somebody who would en- enhance hers. And so overall, I would say it was a pretty dream process. So how, how much input did she have in that design process? So... The way that kitchen worked was, and I I started with season one, and just as a rule, season one shows are productions or even feature films are the hardest to do because you're basically creating something from Genesis, and uh, it's a it's a huge collective and collaborative process among many different entities. Um, In television, you have networks and executives and uh, creatives and myself, and as well as, in this particular case, um, Martha Stewart and Snoop, which are huge global names. And, um, and so there's a certain nervousness. And then their, pre- their publicists, and then their agents, and then their representatives, and ultimately their brand. In Martha's case, she has a pretty big brand behind her. And so there's a lot of, um, a lot of weighing in. So it was, to say the least, in unbelievably collective and political. So, um, so yeah, I was basically, uh, it was, it was like kind of stepping into D day there with a lot of bullets and different ideas being thrown at you. Um, I will say though, I just, I just loved it. I, I, I really thought it was an opportunity to learn from someone so great and so big. So uh, so yeah, I guess, did that help answer? I'm not really yeah, sure. Did you, uh, when, when you were in that process, did you find yourself at moments? Um, I mean, I can imagine working with somebody so huge like that, that you might find moments where you are kind of holding back a little bit because you're afraid of messing up. Um, and you have to kind of remind yourself like, oh, wait, no, I, that this, is, this is my job. I've got to push forward and, and, and make this the best that I can, and I can't become intimidated. It's Did interesting. You have moments like that. Well, for sure. I mean, so many moments, honestly, in all these season one productions. We're working on one, one right now for NBC, and it's similar in terms of there is a certain amount of bravery that you need to have, of, I, I'm learning, and confidence um, in not just your decisions, but confidence in order to kind of like be, make yourself open to other ones and uh, ambidextrous or flexible enough to develop. I have noticed that there is um, less of a strain on maintaining a certain concept um, as, the, as, as hard as it is to keep yourself flexible enough to take in new ideas, even last minute that, um, can basically alter and change an original thought, but ultimately when you take a step back, uh, makes it better. And so, um, was there a specific example of that when something kind of came in last minute and you, you felt like for a moment, like, Oh, that kind of threw me off track, but I've got to make it work. Yeah. So, I mean, basically when I stepped into Martha and Snoop, you know, I walked in and had set 
uh, an immediate kind of concept that we were going to have two split kitchens under one roof, right? And so we have Snoop's side and Martha's side. But, and ultimately it's under one roof and this roof was basically drawn down the middle and we had the, the black and purple side and we had the white cream and beige side. And I tried to hold on to that lower, low, that common denominator as a through line, but all sorts of doubts and um, questions would come at sort of like standing in front of a fire hose. For instance, um, the biggest one was, uh, from a particular entity. Um, how do I unify them more? How do we get them closer together? How do, wh- where do we show a unity under this house? And so, um, the last minute, you know, there was a big decision to, um, express a more unified, uh, home not just under the shape of this gable roof. And so, you know, it, it's a challenge ultimately. And as a designer, I'm here to really fix any challenge or meet any challenge by fixing and providing a solution and ultimately in the most uh, beautiful way. So it was um, my idea to unify the flooring, but maybe use two different subtle um, tones of, of wood woven together um, to find that middle ground. And so the planked hardwood flooring is patterned in the herringbone. And I used two different shades, um, both in the kind of warm gray land, but basically bringing together two different worlds. So, you know, ultimately everybody felt really happy and confident with that. And it is a nice texture uh, in the show that kind of brings it together. It's nice. If you look at that set, it is kind of divided down the middle with the Snoop side is like you said, is kind of, like a, I don't know if I'm getting this right, like a purple and there's a car grill on the front of it. And then Martha's side is a softer colors and it has some copper cookware on the front of the, um, the, the counter islands. And so you use the floor pattern pattern then to, to, to unify yeah. by having two different colors that were I did. Uh, hatched together. Yeah, okay. I did. I used the flooring on, below them because the surfaces were treated very contrast. This is strict um, Snoop Dogg palette. This is, we're going to use a black glass tile. We're going to use a lot of uh, high gloss purple. We're going to use a lot of uh, antique gold finishings. And over here with Martha, we're going to use a lot of uh, white shiplap, a white subway tile with a gray grout. We're going to use a faux bois wallpaper with a gray on white. There's a definitively their tastes. And then there was this challenge of brought to me like, well, it's, it, it's, it's two side by side. How do we unify? So we use the flooring. So typically at what stage of a production, say a season one production, do you typically come in? Mm. It varies across the board on every single one, but ultimately it's in my line of work, which I love is I'm, I'm often brought in way before the executive producers, basically within show development. And, And in fact, um, I'm, also involved with many shows even before they're sold. So developing shows in its kind of fetus stage, I guess, where a network is coming up with an idea or an executive producer is coming up with an idea. They contact me and I develop the environment for them because, and ultimately here's the reason why, I exist in the variety world. And so variety television is basically boiled down to award shows, game shows, reality shows, competition shows, things with big expressive environments or things that are documenting human nature ultimately. And to me, as I explain this is production design then turns into the script. And so I'm brought in to create an environment, which ultimately has to affect human behavior really early, well before the director and oftentimes way before many producers. And so with, uh, project I'm working on right now with NBC. Um, I was brought in, in December and we're shooting in uh, September. And I was brought in before several showrunners and directors just to establish a look. And I think that that's important in order to find um, the overall tone and mood of 
each production. So um, it's helpful for me to get into it, get ahead and establish, you know, uh, establish what the show is about. And, um, and then it's what the, the stressful part is, is as other people start to enter the process, you basically have to just keep, you know, your water legs Changing there going. Yeah, and- exactly. Is that how it worked for you that early in the process with say, uh, Bill Nye saves the world, the Netflix mm-hmm. series. Mm-hmm. I was brought in early on. I, um, pencil sketched out some early concepts I was what did they say to you when they when they brought you on for like the first thing? Like, what was the what was the stage the idea was was at at that point? They wanted what was unique about the Netflix project was they wanted my artistic concept. They didn't want to. They just wanted to know what my vision was early, and so I came in with a strong vision. And we kind of stayed with that and just adjusted to uh, the needs of the production and you know how to best um, shoot it, but. Ultimately, I, I went in and they, they basically said, so um, we're going we're gonna to do a talk show with Bill Nye, but we don't want it to be a talk show talk show. So um, w- what do you think? Bring us some ideas. And so I did. I penciled out a couple of ideas and actually found up, wound up um, falling in love with Bill's uh, deep passion for swing dancing and um, started off there. Now, there probably aren't necessarily the naked eye literal swing dance references, but, you know, in some, in some surfaces and, and the overall shape of the stage, um, we basically maintained a lot of the old original concept. There's, there's now a huge laboratory, um, modern in structure and pretty, uh, pretty relative to modern day and functional laboratories. But ultimately that was his dance floor and where he would perform. And that's really what he's doing is, is he's sort of a, off into the middle doing science experiments and performing uh, to the audience. And then when he steps off the dance floor, he's intimately engaging with the audience right there in front of him. So they're saying we want a show with Bill Nye. And so it was at least part of your input of, okay, we're going to have this big, it's almost like a, like a cell, like a cell, like on a, like, like biology cell, uh, where where that is his laboratory. He does experiments inside the laboratory to, um, demonstrate certain things and then a screen drops down in the front for maybe video that comes from one of his correspondents that is traveling or something like that and then there's the table that's off on the front of the stage where he'll bring in a panel of experts and uh, i mean was all of that how much how much of that was uh your input oh sure yeah so i mean i ask a lot of questions as a designer right and i kind of turn into a shepherd of sorts um, so, oh, James, we're going to do a show with Bill Nye. What should it look like? Well, the follow-up question is, is what is Bill going to do? Oh, well, you know, he'll do some science experiments and then he'll probably sit and chat with, um, someone who's probably been out in the field or, uh, you know, a, an expert of some sort. And, and then, this is who telling you this? This is the executive producer or? Uh, this is the, this was at, for this project, this was the network and executive producer. Gotcha. Um, and it's all very, very loose. You know, we want him to sit down with a panel of experts. We want to sit. We want him to sit down with uh, a one-on-one expert. We want him. We want him to engage with a small audience. We want him to do a lot of science. So that's what we're thinking right now. But again, they know when they don't know. I definitely think that networks and uh, executive producers who are involved in the early concepts of each production are really ultimately the visionaries with no vision. And so they have a very specific idea in their head, but they don't know how it looks. And so to me, that's easy. You know, they, they, they basically want three, uh, three areas. And then the follow-up question is, is, okay, do we need to have some sort of screen or something to show the audience things? Like, do we need anything uh, like a, a playback is what they call it. So we need any, any space for playback so we can roll a clip. Oh yeah, yeah. We probably should have that. We definitely want that. Okay, great. Well, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll think of something there. And so then from there, I've got like somewhat marching orders in order areas that I need to accommodate and have. It sounds like the, I mean, it actually sounds kind of like the attributes of a nightmare client that would come to you and say, uh, in, in a way it's like, 
I, I'll know it when I see it, but it just, you just happen to be working with people who I imagine have a, a good feel for this kind of thing. Is that accurate to you? Yes. Well, I wouldn't say every client is a dream, first and <laughs> foremost, but I will say that I'm not a salesman. I, I really am. I'm not. I, I speak visually. Um, I sometimes trip over my own words and I, I'm not here to convince anybody or sell them on an idea. And you know, that, that works for many people and many designers, but I'm, I'm here to kind of take a vision or a strong idea and then build an environment around it that supports it and also affects it. And so what I might do, I'm very open to, it may not be always right, you know? So I, I like to start big and work down to this granular level. And when I put out an idea, sometimes you hit a home run. I mean, we're doing a job with Hulu right now. It's a late night talk show. And we cracked a home run. And it really from the, the host to the producers to the network, everyone loved it. A couple of tweaks in furniture, but ultimately like a, you know, this is really good. And then sometimes you start with a piece of clay and you, you, you work up a shape and you work up a little space. And it's not right. They look at it and they say, ah, we were thinking, this is not going to, this is not the right vibe. And you start again. There's no harm there. It's not, it's not that bad. And I agree, you know, especially when you hear the feedback and you have to really hear the feedback, take a breath, go for a little walk, look at, look at it the way they're looking at it and see what they're bumping on. Try again. I feel like trial and error is not a fail. It's actually just a way to find the sweet spot. So does it really just start with a conversation? I mean, I'm thinking back to like my days of working in advertising where uh, there might be a creative brief, like there's a written document that the, you know, the the client has collaborated on or something and said, this is kind of what we want to accomplish and the ways that we might accomplish it. And then that is a starting point. Is there any sort of uh, guiding documents like that for you early on in this process? I would almost say, 5%. 5%. Okay. Yeah, sure. I get like a, a well, a well plated out PDF of a three or four pages of, and it's usually, um, how the show will, how the production will format in terms of like how it will go from, uh, beginning, middle to the end. Right. And they 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 may include images from previous productions of, It's kind of like this show meets this show, but I wouldn't say that I ever really get any kind of like style tips or, um, tonality, uh, references at all. I mean, I'll get a dialogue going and we'll start trading tear sheets back and forth. And are they talking at all about, Oh, who they want this to appeal to? Yeah. I usually ask like, okay, well, who's my target audience? Is this like a 16 year old girl? Is this a 45 year old white guy? Like, who am I going for here? But that's to me, secondary information. I like that. They tell me how the show works. I need to know how a show works. Like if I'm going to be in a haircutting competition, I need to know if I'm starting off, um, hearing the competition and then running to a desk. And then is there, what do I do a, a hair wash. And then do I do a blow? Like, what do they see these, the steps, you know, I need to know that stuff, but I think that there's some, I think it's a dialogue. I mean, they start off with their loose vision and then I, then from there send them, uh, tear sheets and inspiration images of, of, um, conveyed feelings based in architecture or sculpture or art and sort of say like, well, your show makes me feel like this. And your show makes me feel like the audience should feel like this. And actually me, to me, most importantly, the show should feel like this to the people who are in it. Um, the host or the competitors or the award takers, this is the way it should feel to them who are doing it. So I kind of, send a whole bunch of images. And then from there, we sort of like use them as a litmus test and say, yeah, you're nay. And kind of hone in on about, to me, about three or four that really speak to the show. And then 
I gotta put them in a blender and take my pencil out. So it's almost like a little, like a, a, a I, there's different words people use for this, but like a vision board where you might show them uh, some pictures from some architecture or, or maybe from another show or uh, something like that. And it's, and, and it is, yes, this has the feel that we're looking for, or no, it doesn't. And if it does have the feel you're looking for, then you start to look for the design elements and you know what is it about the shapes and the coloring and the lighting and stuff that create that feeling. Is that the way that you approach that? Yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I print out the images that I feel like are really speaking about the show. And then I put them, I put them up on a magnet board above my desk. And then, um, and then I draw the show out in terms of its spatial relationships. And then I use the images to sort of help dictate to me, um, what the textures and the finishes will be and maybe influence how the shapes kind of work out. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I think that's a really good way to speak to the unconscious of, of the viewer because I mean, it's it, people have such a hard time articulating sometimes what they want a design to look like. But if you start with the feeling and mm-hmm. then you take the design elements from the things that evoke that feeling, then mm-hmm. you and why end yeah. up close to target. Yeah, right. And why? And then you end up closer to your target. Right. Starting really, really big, starting really, really ethereal and then kind of honing in on which ones and then putting it together. Now, again, this is just the way I do it. Many designers um, will put their point of view straight forward and they're hired because they do this specific point of view that is quite beautiful and, um, and, 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 and on trend, if you will, if you will, just for lack of a better expression. But, uh, I don't really know if necessarily if I believe that I kind of feel like every project I work on should be unique to each other. And inherently my taste will contaminate each, each one, but, I think that each one needs to have its own identity and its organism and whatever it is. Um, and so it's important for me to s- discover that in these early stages. Yeah. The, the voice and mm-hmm. uh, Martha and Snoop's potluck and Bill Nye. I mean, they all look totally different. I wouldn't guess that they were. Oh, thank the God that I've done a good job. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So it sounds like you're 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 going from the roots of what they're trying to to evoke, and I hope. So I mean, you know, ultimately, approaches. it's like if people enjoy it and if it looks good, uh, then you kind of win, I guess. You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. What about camera movement? Movement I, I, on Bill Nye saves the world. I, you know, I don't. I don't have as much experience looking at uh, set designs as you do, but there's so much the depth of the camera movement he's he's in this giant cell as i call it the laboratory yeah. and he's way way back and the camera is so far away but then he move, he moves forward um for other parts of the show how much is that camera movement how much input do you have on that or, or you know, where oh, does sure. that come from and most of the sets that i do um i kind of think about camera movement uh, secondarily. And I like to create a space that is utterly uh, immersive. And so I will use cameras um, because I mean, like, listen, like cameras now um, can do anything. You can put a camera on anything. And so you can get a GoPro to fit on anything. You can move around with somebody. You can take a big sweeping shot. I mean, heck, you can even almost use a drone anywhere now. And so it's more important for me to build the environment first and then work with the director on how to create really fluid, beautiful camera moves that help tell this story. There was a large discussion with Bill to get into the dance floor, the lab, and then come out. And how are we going to do that all the time in and out? And what did it feel like when he was in the lab? And what did it feel like when he was out of the lab? And we wanted that definition between uh, both worlds. And so when, when he was in the lab, you almost wanted him to feel alone with you as the viewer at home. And then when he got out of the lab, you wanted him to feel relatable to the audience right there, touching tangibly um, and engaging with them. And so we used the techno crane and we used the steady cam and we used different cameras 
uh, to get deep into the space and then to pull out with Bill and that tracking motion with Bill was important. So, so it starts with working with a producer, getting that feel down. Um, maybe there's a couple renderings or something done at that point, getting the, the samples of what the, the design vocabulary, and then you start working with the director and that's when things like camera movement come into play. Is that about right? Yes, it's about right. And there's a, there's, um, it's actually a reverse thinking traditionally. And so oftentimes I'm, you know, I'm the young guy now in Hollywood. So oftentimes some of the first meetings people will say to me, well, where are the cameras going to go? And I kind of say, guys, stop, stop right there. We will figure that out. Let's get the, let's get the space right. If I need to move three people over or get rid of some audience members here or there or cut a wall in half to put a camera in, that's what we'll do on the next pass. But right now, it's just about establishing what this world is all about. And so if you can get, if you, if you can get everybody on the same page with that, then fixing the camera angles is easy. Was, was that a notable, a notably different thing that the uh, Bill Nye set was so deep, like I was talking about? I really wanted to create a space that was like visually enriching and vast and real. And I think that when you're in real spaces, um, you get an appreciation of height, uh, especially spaces of, um, academia and knowledge. Um, and the title of the show is Bill Nye Saves the World. Like there's a global discussion here of in all sorts of different topics. And ultimately what Bill's going to do is touch each single one. And there's so many, like it's vast. And I want that to feel real. And when you go to a big library or a laboratory or something like that, you generally as a person, uh, who doesn't go into those things often kind of say, wow. And so when we boil that down to this word, wow, you know, it needed to be big and rich. And so Bill's world needed to have an incredible amount of depth. And so when you start expanding his background further and further back photographically, the camera will see the tops of things. And so you make the heights a little bit bigger and then suddenly you have a big space, but ultimately it's because, um, you watched it and it, 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 it was on purpose that you saw something that said, Whoa, holy cow. That's, that's, uh, it's quite a space. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, what about the design language? I guess some of the things that I'm seeing were there are these hexagonal uh, ceiling tiles, hexagonal tiles on the front, uh, in front of the, uh, laboratory inside the laboratory. There are, it's, it's just the shiniest floor it looks like it's like not even real uh, with these dots on it are are these and i and i see the um the spiral staircase reminds me of like a dna double helix are these are these uh are you intentionally speaking to uh honeycomb structures and double helixes or is that me uh, ascribing intentions where where they aren't Oh yeah. And yes, yes to all. I, you know, when you're in design meetings, you hear certain things and you get a lot of feedback from your visionary client. And so, uh, at one point somebody had said somebody, somebody had said something like a beehive of science and, you know, that stuck out with me. And how do you, how do you create that in this lab, a beehive of science? But, so then is the shape of the lab actually uh, hexagonal? Is it like beehive? It is. Or I, I was thinking of it as like a cell of a, of a plant or something. It is a big hexagon elongated. And there the, the, there is a repeated hexagon shape. The, the hexagon has a, an incredible amount of geometry attached to it when you research this shape. It's really a unique... Uh, it's really a unique shape. And just because this show has been as further away from me. I couldn't describe it so detailed. However, it's one of the most, um, it's one of the strongest shapes and self-sustaining in terms of like, if you were actually physically to build a hexagon, uh, it's like the triangle, like it really is a very strong, um, shape. So I started, I kind of started with that a little bit. Um, I specifically chose a circular stair to be behind, uh, Bill on center line for the direct reference. Um, 
at, to the double helix. I mean, it's, it looks oh, wow. just like a double helix. It's the perfect piece of architecture. And it really is beautiful um, as its own little piece. And so when you're watching Bill and you have a spiral staircase behind him, um, it just sort of, sort of seems right, doesn't it? You know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, and in fact, it was Bill who pointed out to me that it's not actually a spiral. Um, a spiral tapers up or tapers um, in its diameter as it moves all the way up. A circular stair um, doesn't taper. And so, well, you know, you learn something all the time. Well, and, I, I, and a spiral staircase has has a straight axis, right? So a double helix would have like these two winding axes, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's definitely not a, like that. It's definitely not a helix. Um, <laughs> but it's a relatable piece of architecture that you would be it. in a lab all the time. Yeah. If it was a literal helix, it would be too much. Oh, yeah. I mean, you couldn't get in. Um, I mean, I see it because I'm a designer, but I think the audience probably just in their subconscious, they, you know, they, they get the reference, but consciously they're probably not getting the reference, but that's what, not makes, at all. That's what makes good design. And I think that it makes good design so that you walk the line of subtlety and you still support. I mean, I, I really did start off with the circular stare. It was a strong idea. I felt like this is really good. I need to include this. This needs to be direct in his background. This is science, really. Um, and it's a scientific shape. And I started, I started there and I started with white because I, and then it really kind of drove quite a bit. Like, how do I make this pop off the background? So the background needs to be in sort of like organic muted tones. And it just so happens that it was, well, we explored different types of brick, but, um, it just so happens that it was brick, red brick, and then how it related to the contrasting worlds of, uh, acad- traditional academia in this large library type structure and then the contrasting cold sort of artificial um uh clean laboratory space and so but ultimately it was this white circular stair that was this keystone and you do so much work Uh, if i look at your imdb page it's just an overwhelming amount of amount of work and but you have a staff right uh that you've built uh i imagine that to um to do this much work and still have, you know, your signature to it, you have to really know your process. Well, is that accurate? That's and- accurate. You're good. You are good. Um, <laughs> you got it. That's exactly it. I love what I do and I love particular parts of the process. And I don't, I get so, I get so like, it's a sickness. I get so excited about new things and new ways to create, uh, when you're first talking about a project that I get addicted almost. Um, and, and after doing cert- so many, uh, one after the other, some parts of the process can be, um, polished, you know, in terms of like how to build a budget, how to create, uh, something from pencil sketch into construction drawings. And so just by wash, rinse, repeat, I have been, developing. So, uh, you know, it started off as, as an assistant. Um, Hey, I I know where that store is. I know exactly what I want. Please go buy it. Something of that level to gosh. Yeah. Now we have a office in Valley village here in Los Angeles and it's 2,500 square feet. And I have six people on staff and then three or four permalancers. And it is a, it's an operation as opposed to a process. And it's just, it's just by osmosis that it's developed. So when you were first starting out, I mean, that was a great detail of like, Oh, I know where that store is where we can get that couch or, or whatever yeah. that we need. I mean, knowing these, knowing those little details, if you don't have the staff to start with um, and you don't know where the store is and that can really slow you down. Yeah. Um, how, how did your, you know, I imagine when you were first starting out, it took a while to, to establish that process. How did that happen? Um, well, every time, you know, you learn something new. And so I always would take a postmortem look after the project was over and self-analyze in, internally and also then talk to um, the assistant at the time or the client at the time or whoever and say, how did that go? You know, like how, what could we do better? But I think it's also being a student of your own work and being a crazy perfectionist 
that I look back at projects. It's, it's, David, it's so hard to look back at old stuff because all you do is see mistakes, you know, and even on Bill and, and, and the voice in its early seasons and they're just hard things to see. And you're like, God, I never want to do that again. I screwed that up. We can do that better. And that's always gotten a little bit, uh, that process a little bit further along. I mean, it probably is torture for some of the people that work here, but I think that people who work with me are similar and always self-improving. And it takes a certain personality, I guess, you know? When you do that post-mortem, are you writing in a notebook? Or are you just sitting and thinking with your favorite drink? How, how do you do that? <laughs> um, sometimes now we all sit together in a, around a table and we talk it out. We generally, we have gotten, um, you know, we have written things down on a notepad and saved it to a folder and put it into a, a, you know, the Dropbox folder for the overall project and put it away. But you know what? I have never looked back ever on these things. Usually, um, just talking it out has, I don't even know, it really has helped, you know? And sometimes you have to make the same mistake three or four times before you're like, I'm never, <laughs> I'm never going to do that again. Um, yeah, I don't know. Th- these are not mistakes in terms of like, um, you know, huge tragedies because the nature of my business is service to fix problems in a beautiful way for camera work, you know? So I I, am here to fix things basically and create things that make a situation, which is a problem. So, you know, it's not terrible, but, um, but yeah, and sitting and talking about it and just being humble enough to, um, to make yourself better is, is how, how it was, how it's been done. Have you gotten to the point where you have kind of like formal names for phases of the projects? Yeah, there are two, um, <laughs> I, you know, sure. There's the design process. There's a development process. Then there's the design process. There is the, uh, the drafting process, which was, means we're technically drawing everything now, out. For what the happens in the development process that doesn't happen in the design process? Um, usually it's a lot of conceptual work and tear sheets and pencil sketches and things to me that are budget like budget free, you know, like I'm not worried about money. I'm not worried about how big the door is to bring everything inside. I'm not worried about how many guys it's going to take to do X, Y, and Z. I'm just going to create the perfect space. So you're not worrying about the details in the beginning so that you can be creatively free to come up with some sort of vision. And then later on, there's another phase where you start worrying about those details. Absolutely. That's the design process where you start to then refine the developed concept into something probably a little bit more achievable. This is something that I discovered myself as a designer. Uh, My background is in graphic design. And, you know, as a student, I would just obsess over things so much. and I would get these creative blocks. But then when I worked for an architecture firm and I realized in architecture, there are these they have actual project phases that you have to follow because you're not going to decide what kind of bolts are on the staircase until you decide whether there's a staircase or not. And there's, you know, like there's. The creative process works that way, but in something like architecture, I think in in what you do as well, there's there's the the restrictions of kind of budget and of physically making things that holds you that help control the process, so you aren't worrying about those details too early in the process. Is that anything that you've learned or observed over your career? Yes, and I think that that's probably come out of working with clients and then basically providing them a format of the process so that they can not worry I mean, as an architect or as a production designer or as somebody who knows how they do something, you know, they know that the, the nuts and the bolts comes later. But as you're walking somebody through that, who's new to that process, or even like a junior employee, it's good to label those things. And so I could probably actually could probably wind up doing that internally. We do that on some of the larger projects. Um, it's where, okay, guys, we're, we're still in development. Let's not talk about what pillow that's going to be yet. Well, just, we're, like we're, you were yet. About, just like you were talking about the client that's, that's wondering, oh, well, where the camera's going to go. So oh, yeah. on. it's like, oh, it's like, relax. We're still, we're still over here. We'll get there. But it's actually probably a really good idea to maybe firmly label them. Although, you know, sometimes it is kind of nice to hear those ideas 
you know, in the beginning as well. There are these aren't hard edges, really. You know, they should be soft edges that we can break. If somebody has a great idea that they experienced that they want to bring to the table, and it does have to do with something um, detail oriented or camera oriented, we should be able to talk about that in the beginning phases. That should be allowed. Well, yeah, and, and maybe maybe sometimes there's a tile sample or a fabric sample or something that you just love, and you're like, I got to use this in some project at some time, and you're kind of thinking about it early on in the process, um, but it's not not to a point that it's preventing you from moving forward in the creative process. Is that right? Right, exactly. It shouldn't be an excuse to stop some sort of creative journey. I it's completely like a agree. Be held idea. Yeah, right. yeah. And it should be used as um, constructive, positive. Uh, development. Oh, this tile could be the inspiration for the entire space we're going to create. And that's something that we should talk about. Not, you know, where is that going to go? Oh, I don't know yet. And since you have your process pretty well developed now, I imagine, I mean, do you find that you get creatively stuck less often than you did earlier on in your career? Hmm. I or don't do you get at all. creatively stuck. <laughs> I don't at all. I never get creatively stuck. Really? No, I don't. Um, I get tired. And so I get exhausted. And so sometimes I will cheat a decision because I know the answer. I know what will kind of work. It's probably not the most creative solution. Um, but I know this will work. So I'll just do this. And so I can fall into. In, in exhaustion, I can fall into ruts, uh, quick ones, but I don't get stuck ever. I think that, no, I mean, if you actually take the time to sit down and think about something, there are a billion different things to do. I, I give them away. I mean, take it. I, I don't want to see old crap, throw it away. It's just old, you know, here's an idea. Oh, you don't like it? Great. Let's think of another one. I don't, I don't get stuck. I do find the need though to take a break. And I think exhaustion is probably the, uh, the poison sometimes. And so then maybe that you could call that getting stuck, but maybe not. Well, know. yeah, when you get exhausted, I, I mean, I've had guests on the podcast, um, a neuroscientist that studies insights and a, another guest who wrote a book about the importance of, of rest and it's, it's, um, it's role in the incubation of creative ideas. I mean, I could see how, when you're exhausted and you don't have the creative energy to uh, come up with that perfect solution. You have to take a break. You really do. I mean, I know that sounds, you know, maybe lazy. It's not, not at know. all. <laughs> you have to get out of the studio, walk away from the painting, stop what you're doing, go experiencing some, go experience something new. If that means, you know, partying with a huge group of your friends or experiencing, uh, a new museum or traveling to some place with your partner or by yourself or going to the, like whatever it is to become inspired by anything will come back, bring it back to your own work. I mean, just recently I went through a terrible breakup, um, in March and I was exhausted. It was tough. It was one of those like divorce things with paperwork and money. And I was in the middle of many, many projects at the time, some in design, some being installed. And it was tiring, you know, it was really rough. And I took, I, I don't usually do this, but I booked a trip to see some family in Charleston, South Carolina. And I just left and, you know, obviously touching base with my office here and there to make sure that the wheels were still in motion. And it was around the 4th of July. And I can't tell you, David, how much inspiration and, um, new ideas that brought back to my work. It was like I took a giant bucket with me to like the idea well and like dunked it in and brought it back. And I really um, made me feel uh, or not feel really re reiterated or stressed the importance of what that can do to projects. I mean, I came back to this thing that I was sort of midstream on and threw it all away and said, and told the producers, I said, I just got back from Charleston. Th this architecture that they're building right now is really something we should look at. Look at some of these details here. Look at some of these um, finishes here. Look at how they've shaped out this space here. Like this is 
modern traditional. This is where what we want to achieve. And it, oh God, it was everything. So was it difficult? I mean, you're, you're going through this incredibly difficult time and you have all these projects and these deadlines bearing down on you. Was it, was it hard for you to realize that, uh, that it was time to take a break? Did you try to not take a break? I just tried to keep it together. You know, I mean, life happens and in art, you know, some it, art basically is this great, you know, reflector and, and, and feels it, but it's still, you're still working, right? I mean, somebody in my business is still working. You can't tell television to stop. I'm having a bad time. Please stop. We have to push the schedule. That's never going to happen. I mean, even as a fine artist, you have a deadline to show at a gallery or whatnot. I can't stop that train. Um, and life happens to everyone. It's totally normal. You know, uh, it was tiring. I think it was exhausting. It, it was great to have the art to lean on, to get out of your head from nine to five or whatever our hours are, eight thirty to six or whatever. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, I would spend more time on the art so I could continually escape. It was nice to then put those feelings into the art, make some pieces a little bit more, I don't know, whatever I was feeling at the moment. Um, it's, I love what I do because it can be this sponge for emotion and usually turn out okay. So um, it's interesting. I did Top Chef Colorado at the time and I would consider some of the of my most proud work. It looks really fucking good. And I think it's because I put a lot of energy in it at the time into tons of details um, because I ha- I wanted to escape. I wanted to go into that world as opposed to the one that I was living in. Is there any way that you can sense when a certain type of, um, you know, non-work activity is going to jostle the creativity that you need out of you? Just repeat that one more time. Am I, am, do I use, say that again? My head <laughs> are, are, are there any, like you were talking about going on a trip um, yeah. or you know, taking a break in general. Are there those things or other things that you actually use strategically where you have some kind of a sense of, okay, this is the time when I need to do this particular thing? Or is it really just by feel? I, I'd say like just creating, creating your own, um, your own amount of bandwidth to be free of whatever you have to do is basically what is basically where you unexpectedly find those moments. And so if I can escape the obligations of some of the work that I'm doing, art isn't perfect. It's not, it's not just pure. Like you're usually have to, even Michelangelo had a client, you know? So if you can get out, you rip yourself out of that and then go and experience your feelings and other, and something new, uh, you know, free of charge without a lot of, restrictions, that's generally kind of where I think sometimes that, that magic comes from. And so I, I, you know, I definitely try to, on the purse, on the daily side, try to create, um, spaces for me, me to do that, despite how busy it can really be or a late night. I can, I generally try to carve out time to do things like that. Some people meditate, you know, and that sounds hippy dippy, but that, you know, can you go for a run in your neighborhood? Can you take your dog for a walk? Can you call your mother? It's just some things that just get you out of that full concentration. I think then, you know, little sparks happen. And uh, we're just about out of time. I want to make sure, because I asked most of my guests, uh, what's the last book that you read that changed the way you saw something? Oh my God. I, you know, I just downloaded Ready Player One, but that doesn't, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to that. Um, I'm listening to a lot of things like podcasts, for instance, this one. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, reading, my God, uh, I'm such a visual person. I, when was the last book I read? I don't even know. Um, no, you're more in the audio realm. You're more... Uh, I'm audio fixed and I'm visually 
just addicted. Does that fit your lifestyle in a certain way? Like, I mean, one of the reasons I love this, I love having this podcast is because I have to do a lot of cooking, you know, cause I've got like a, a certain diet I follow and stuff. And so, and, or, or from like the gym, I can listen to podcasts and I'm doing work basically, um, researching or li- re-listening to an interview to find the, the nuggets and stuff. Is there some way that audio fits your lifestyle better? A hundred percent. I love, love, love to take a nice walk. Um, there's a, there's a Canyon right by my house and it's about four miles, three and some change. And for a nice slow walk for about an hour, hour and a half, I can, I can devour a podcast, a story, a book, and just, just suck it all up. And it, it, it can take you right out of your world. And I, I really prefer that. What are some of the other podcasts that you're enjoying? Oh, sure. Right now I am listening to, I'm just going to pull up my little uh, app here. I love Gimlet's startup. I'm loving that right now. I love um, Adventures in Design. I love The Art of Charm. Um, I, I'm just about to start Ready Player One. And I love, what else? I got another one right here. Oh, Clever is really great. Um, and... Oh, where's my little list here? Oh, didn't you just love Missing Richard Simmons? Oh, that, that was, was that was a fun one. Yes, really good. That was amazing. Um, and sometimes for a little bit of like soap, um, I uh, listen to this podcast called Bitch Sesh, which is a uh, wrap up podcast on the Real Housewives of God only knows what on Bravo. And it was so funny. I was at this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm, just, I'm basically going to cover my ass here on this one. Um, and you're like, what real housewives? But yeah, I was literally, and there's a common bond here between me and this artist. I was just at an artist studio, this woman named Barry, um, zip, oh, zip, Barry Zipperstein. And she creates pottery for, um, Kelly Wurstler and, uh, and Jonathan Adler. And she's uh, this incredible fine artist that creates all this handmade pottery. And, we both absolutely love the Real Housewives of Atlanta or Orange County or whatnot. And it was funny to connect on that because she said, you know, just like me, she's running this business and she's creating art so that you have this balance of creation and management, creation and management. It's oftentimes just exhausting. Yeah. And she said, it's just so nice to listen to something, you know, not dumb, but rather just like that just takes you out and just, you know, it's just like, it, pleasure. It, it's is that what they call soapy. It? Yeah, exactly. It's this guilty pleasure. And, uh, and so I completely connect with that. And so sometimes bitch sesh is just the right amount of humor and good soapy trash that I love. Great. Yeah. Um, it's, we've talked about so many cool things today. Um, the design process, uh, and, uh, resting to, move things along and such. Do you have a final message that you would sum up our conversation with today? Oh, hmm. A final message to everyone listening, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. And for me too, you know. Sure. I guess, I mean, I I, I never really had any specific direction. I never uh, said growing up, I want to be a production designer for TV and do television sets. I just chose things that made me feel happy. And I, I I just wanted to work on things that made me feel happy. And it was, it was the pressure to get better at it, but not make myself miserable that got me here. And I I, I want everybody to just to, just to continue to do, you know, or, or get out of what's making them upset or, or miserable. Like stop, you can, you can stop what you're doing right now and still live a very happy life art school is okay to do. You go for it. I mean, I'm doing this. It's awesome. Wow. You just like summed up the whole premise of the show right there. So I, <laughs> yeah, I just think it's so important. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen next year. I don't know what's going to happen 10 years from now, but I guess I'll tell you one thing though. I'm not going to do anything that's going to make me feel miserable at all. And hopefully I'll continue to make some money, but if not, it's fine. <laughs> And I think you're going to have some new fans from today's uh, episode. Where can people find more of you? Yeah, well, I, I'm on Instagram all the time. It's um, at JP Connolly, J P C O N N E L L Y. And what I try to do is um, Insta story all the time, or just sort of show cool things that I'm like, or cool people that I'm talking to. So I went to these two studios today. It's all a bunch of really awesome pottery um, from two amazing artists or, um, you know, how to build a set. And so we're doing the teen choice awards on Sunday. And so my teen choice awards diaries, um, it's sort of, 
it helps me talk to people even like you, David, and explain really this like psychosis that I'm in. So it, it's like good practice. But anyways, I'm on Instagram and um, there it is, JP Connolly. Wonderful. James, thank you so much for taking yeah, the thank time you. to talk today. It's been this great. Was fun. Awesome. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with James Conley. Be sure to see his work in action on The Voice, on Martha and Snoop's Potluck Dinner Party, or on the Netflix original Bill Nye Saves the World. James talked about the importance of disconnecting to avoid getting creatively stuck. There's actually science to back that up. Listen to John Cunios on episode eight. John is a neuroscientist who studies the nature of creative insights. Sleep is not doing nothing. Sleep is mental work. Sleep is creative work. Your brain is churning over memories. It's clearing out the mental cobwebs. It's generating ideas. Sleep is itself work. So if a person is trying to solve a problem and they take a nap to sleep on it, that's not not working on the problem. That is working on the problem. Again, John is on episode eight. James also talked about the importance of doing postmortems for continuous improvement. This is something Noah Kagan talked about on his first appearance on the show, episode 41. The compounded return... Compounded returns is one of the most amazing things, but the compounded return of the knowledge that will then exist forever is just going to produce like dividends beyond your dreams. Again, Noah is on episode 41. I work hard to help you crack the code on fulfilling work. If Love Your Work is helping you, there are some ways you can help support the show and make it even better. One is to subscribe, 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 subscribe. This is especially effective on Apple Podcasts or iTunes because it boosts rankings and helps others find the show. I know many of you listen on Overcast because you're the early adopter types. So even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please subscribe there anyway. Subscribe in your iPhone, your iPad, your Apple TV, your computer. The more devices, the better. It really helps. Apple Podcast ratings help too. Just go to cadavy.net slash Apple, click on write a review, and click on the star rating. You don't even have to write a review. It just takes a couple seconds. You can also join Love Your Work Elite. You'll get access to episodes before everyone else. You can even get ad-free interviews weeks in advance, and you can get your name or business mentioned in the credits of the show. For details, go to lywelite.com. That's lywelite.com. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by top Love Your Work elite members such as Arif Akhtar. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for the show is More Streets, performed by Spider Flower. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>